Well, hello everybody and welcome to this final Managing Your Sporting Archives session. This is session three, Using Your Archives. Um, these presentations form part of our Uncovering York Sporting Heritage project. My name's Laura and I'm one of the archivists based at Explore York Libraries and Archives. This project has been generously funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, it's a partnership project involving ourselves, York City Football Club Foundation and York City Knights Rugby League Foundation, um, designed to um, bring the sporting heritage of York out to wider communities and connect them more and sports clubs more with the heritage in terms of sport that we hold at Explore and is held by the clubs. This is the final session of three. So initially we looked at what is an archive, which was about how you identify what archives you should be keeping, how you want to arrange those archives in a way that makes sense to those using them, and what archives actually are as a fundamental principle. The second um, session, storing your archives, we looked at the best conditions for um, having your archives in, so in terms of storage, how best to package them and how to avoid them being damaged by pests. And today we're going to be looking at what's arguably the more glamorous bit, how you can use your archives in your own communities with your members. There's two main learning out outcomes objectives for today. So you'll understand the opportunities and challenges around keeping your archives in house or depositing your archives with an archive service. You also hopefully be inspired to develop your own local projects and share your history with your communities. The first question I wanted to talk about though is whether you should deposit your archives with an archive service or not. There are many reasons why clubs and societies look to deposit their archives or don't. Um, the main thing to keep in mind though is that a decision you take now can always change and the archive service will always adapt accordingly. Many sports clubs are within the collecting remit of local archive services, but the question I would ask is, are they actually better in your own community? Archive services can still support you, can still help you in a number of ways, but will you get the maximum benefit of that collection by having it yourself? However, it might be that your storage situation changes, your personnel changes, or God forbid, financially, your club has to fold. Um, all of these situations can make people reassess their collections and what they do with them. As I say, the best thing to do is talk to your local archive service and ask for advice and Explore will certainly do that for York-based clubs. The main advantage to keeping your archive in-house is that you can use it with your members whenever you want and access it easily for outreach activities, displays and online. Ideally, if you did need to deposit your archive service, your archives with an archive service, the service would want at a, as a minimum a box list for the collection. So that's what we covered in the first presentation. And that just means it's more straightforward for them to catalog the collection for you and to repackage it accordingly. Most of the time, this work comes with no cost to your club. Um, but if you had any donations to aid processing or to help purchase packaging, they are always welcome. They're not a prerequisite for depositing your archive, but they are always welcome. Obviously, the two options, um, using your archive in-house for outreach activities and depositing with an archive service, are not mutually exclusive. You can deposit your archive, but then work with the service on outreach activities. And as part of this Uncovering York Sporting Heritage Project, um, that's what we've been doing with York City Football Club Foundation. In the case of York City Rugby League Foundation, they hold the archives themselves and we're working with them and supporting their own outreach activities. So it very much, as I say, depends on the club concerned. You also have to remember that if you deposit your archive collection with an archive service, it's not a case of you'll never see it again. Many services offer a loan option rather than a full gift option, which means that you can deposit your collection for a set period of time in the first instance. Um, and after that, you can either reassess and decide that you want to keep it there longer on another loan agreement, or you can take it back in house and use it yourself. So there's a variety of options they are open to you. Um, also bear in mind that the majority of um, archive services, especially local authority archive services, offer public access through an on-site reading room where the archives can be consulted. So your, your members, your users, your former players can all still access the collection physically if they want to. So it very much depends on your own situation. If you've got it though, and it's in-house, use it. 
there is no point in having an archive collection of whatever size in-house if you're not going to utilise it. And this is not necessarily all about writing a history of your club for the About Us page of your website, although I'm not going to lie, that is useful. Um, using your archives is the most exciting and rewarding result of choosing to care for them yourself. There are so many exciting and innovative ways to use the collection, which can support your organisation, it can help you engage with the local community, attract new members, bring a new dimension to your competitions or leagues or activities. Um, on the screen, you'll see a few ideas listed. These are tried and tested across the country. So public exhibitions, so one-off exhibitions, which are manned and showcase some of the collections from your archive. So photographs, um, programs, different materials, um, using originals, or if you don't have display cases and you want something longer term, you could use surrogate copies, take digital copies and have them printed. Um, you could launch an oral history project to capture the thoughts and memories of local people. Um, so again, former players, um, fans, young people get more of a perspective on, on what your community thinks about your club or your organisation. Um, you can do lectures, talks using the archives, I said in local village halls and libraries, but in your, in your ground, in your, um, your public facilities, your, your boardroom services, a suitable space, you can do them online. Um, and collaborating with local primary and secondary schools. There's a local history module in the school curriculum, um, which often uh, teachers can struggle with. Um, so it doesn't have to be an entire module, an entire um, you know, six week set of classes, but you could produce something that teachers can dip in and out of and can use for a lesson just to, to bring a local focus to that curriculum. Just because these projects have been done before, it doesn't mean they're the only options available to you. You could do something completely different. Um, you could um, update your website, you could start social media, so Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. You could create Pinterest boards of digital content to help people browse the history of your club or browse the, the collections that you hold. Um, you could create physical display boards for walls of your spaces. You could fundraise to buy a display case. Archival display cases aren't particularly cheap, um, but you can fundraise for them and then create small mini exhibitions. Um, or you could go big and apply for grant funding to engage wider audiences with your collections. Um, for York-based clubs, we can support with that and we can also provide training packages that be, can be costed into your bids on a variety of different subjects. So if you've got volunteers or staff who need um, some additional support in copyright or data protection or digitisation, we can, we can help cost that and fund that for you as part of a funding bid. We can write that in. I wanted to give you an idea of some of the things that explored you. Now, obviously we're an archive service, we have um, a number of personnel, but just to give you a flavor of some of the exciting opportunities that you have when you've got archive collections that you can use. Um, so in the, the top row, we've got from left to right, we've got an exhibition, one day exhibition where um, we brought out the York Sport, the Scouts archive, and we got the Scouts to come and um, engage with their own archive collections. We've got a memory tree where we got children to, to put their memories about um, their history of York and what they remember about York and then pin them to the tree. Uh, we've got under fives um, story boxes that we can use in libraries where children can dress up and engage with the archival content in just creative ways with activities. Um, there's the, the kind of slightly more traditional route of um, exhibitions. So there's a standing um, permanent exhibition um, fixed exhibition at Poppleton Library. It gets changed so often by Poppleton History Group, who we work in partnership with, uh, but that's one of their, their exhibition sets of boards. Um, we've got volunteers working on our collections and helping repackage and catalogue our collections there. Um, what Should York Remember was a, a project where we went out into libraries and just asked people in York what should we remember so we knew know what's in the archive but what should we remember aside from that where's the the community um thoughts going what are the the most interesting things that people remember in the city but might not be documented in the collections and then we took those responses and we created a mural at york explorer library um, and the the image immediately underneath what should york remember is one of the panels from that mural so there's a, a big wall mural on one of our carved walls kind of documenting the history of York but through the um, 
the thoughts and memories of its citizens, which is really nice. It's not necessarily what's in the archive itself. The bottom right um, hand side of the screen, the photograph is of um, some of the um, York Normandy veterans. This photograph was taken in 2015. Unfortunately, we've lost a number of the veterans since then. Um, but we hold their archive and we had a big launch event for the, the oral history um, archives that were taken and the archives that we hold as well to get some of their memories. Um, just have a bit of a thing for them um, as part of taking the archive into our control. Um, roller banners, the exhibition at the bottom is a, a three um, banner exhibition which toured our libraries in 2015 um, on the, the subject of the First World War. Roller banners can be really cheap. They can be less than £100 each, designed and printed. Um, if you want to create an exhibition on banners, though, do think about how you can make sure the content doesn't date quickly. Um, so if you're using kind of current as part of this project kind of language, make sure that there's no dates or time periods on there um, in relation to projects that would date it. Um, it's OK with the historical content, but just watch what you're doing with more modern language and more modern um, more modern content. You could also in the bottom left is one of our most successful um, outreach um, opportunities, which is we purchased Lego and we asked people to recreate um, historic York out of it. And we it's a reusable um, activity. It's really, really popular. And we've got some archival maps and some uh, photographs that people can use as inspiration and a big floor mat that then they can recreate their buildings and pop them on the floor mat. Um, you could do something similar. You could purchase Lego and ask people to recreate your stadium or your site. Um, the memory tree that's on the top there is something you could do about any theme. So what are children's favourite memories of your club or of the sport that they play or they take part in or they watch? All these kind of activities are adaptable. You can scale them up, you can scale them down depending on, on what your particular club's interested in and the resources that you have. So one of the things you can do, as I've said here, you can go off piste. I wanted to show you a video which we created in 2016 as part of the Summer Reading Challenge project. This is a stop motion video, um, which was created by a group of children with a couple of professional animators. Um, so it's an interesting one. It's, it's based on the archive collections, and that's the important thing to remember. It was created, scripted, um, designed. All the characters were made by the children. They did their own voiceovers. Um, it's a, it's a really interesting thing to do. It's funded by Arts Council England as part of Explore's Explore Labs project. Um, so it was funded with external funding, but it's not an enormous amount of funding um, by comparison to some other projects. It's something you can do on a fairly small scale. Um, the reason I've included it is A, it does involve a bit of sport. Um, but you could really adapt this technology. You could adapt it to recreate scenes from the lives of your club. Could you recreate your greatest victory? Could you create you know, the lives of one of your players? Um, you do need external expertise, but like I say, external funding is available for this type of thing. Um, and you'll see, you can see in the image, um, the, the still at the moment, um, there is a football involved. The football in this um, story created by the children is an original 1930s signed Arsenal football, which we hold in the archive as part of an autograph collection. Um, so I, I love the fact that they use the football and they use the, the sporting link to pull the storyline straight the way through. So I will remove my headset and then I'll play the video for you.
Downstairs is haunted. There's all stories about the life being haunted anyway. Well, would one like my autograph or not? So that is a radical, a radical um, option for outreach and engagement. But to be honest, it's a great way of engaging younger audiences in particular. Um, and they get a bit of ownership about what they're doing. So that might not be the most historically accurate film I've ever seen. But in terms of engaging those children with the content, um, it was absolutely fantastic. Um, but you could equally use external funding, like I say, for oral history projects or for um, display boards or display cases and things, you can use external funding in a number of different ways. That's the off-piste version, but you can also go smaller scale. So if I swap to our website, we have a community resources page on our website. Um, and as part of that, it's got a number of different sporting heritage resources in particular. So this is part of the wider Uncovering York Sporting Heritage project that we're doing just now. Um, one of the things we are going to do is get a digital touchscreen installed at York's new community stadium with some digital content, some presentations on it that people coming backwards and forwards into the stadium can actually browse the archival content without having to have the originals um, on site. So it's a good way of digital content, it's a good way of um, exposing your audiences to what you hold without having to worry too much about the security in the same way. Um, so on this site, we've got a number of different um, aspects. So we've got some Flickr galleries, for example, this one, Match Day at Bootham Crescent. So using the York City Football Club 
um, archive. We've got um, lots of different content. Each one of these is an image that you can click on and it'll give you more detail about it. You can see um, more information about it there. It just gives you a nice way of browsing some of the content under general themes. Um, there are a number of different sporting themes on that site, but I thought I'd highlight one. And these were just done um, in terms of the digital images. They were quite often just done on a flatbed scanner. We have an archival book scanner at York Explorer Library. So they were done on kind of fairly um, easy to come by technology. So it's not anything in particularly complicated that um, has created this. And Flickr is open source software. Um, the other thing that we've done is created a number of um, Prezi galleries. Prezi, again, is open source, source software. Um, so this one, I wanted to choose the same theme running through. So this is the history of York City Football Club, again, using the, the Football Club Foundation archives that we're holding just now. So if I press present, this is York City FC through the years. You'll see similar content to what we've got on Flickr, but you can click your way through an interactive timeline. So you can decide where you want to go on the timeline and work your way through and you'll get a description of the images. You will get um, the reference number as well. So you can actually see um, where in the archive collection that sits, which is always handy if you want to get copies of it or anything in future, you can see exactly what the reference number is. And you can work your way through the timeline and this work was actually carried out by a placement uh, student with us. We had an intern with us who, who did this work um, as one of a number of jobs. So it wasn't particularly complicated. It didn't take her an enormous amount of time to create, but the overall look is quite effective. And you can link this, as you'll see, we've got this linked from our website. If I go back to the web page, um, all the presentations that she's created are linked to the website. So it's really straightforward to actually hook that up with your website and give people a kind of different view on your collections. The only thing to ensure is if you're going to digitize content and make it available online, that make sure that you don't include personal details from historical records. So things like sports club membership lists, anything that's got personal details that's less than 100 years old um, is covered by the Data Protection Act and that needs to be avoided. But anything, you know, kind of photographic content, visual content is what you're looking for anyway. And um, that tends to engage audiences um, better. So that's the kind of content that you should be looking for. So avoid anything that's got personal details. If I go back to my presentation. The other aspect that I wanted to cover um, in this session is reminiscence. Um, reminiscence is not just about dementia, it's probably more, most commonly um, tied to dementia and those who, who suffer from um, various um, neurological conditions within that dementia is a number of different conditions. Um, but reminiscence itself is arguably, for me, it's much broader. Um, it's about anybody coming together as a group to, to talk about um, what they're interested in, what they remember to share, um, common themes or sports that they might have played, what they did at school. Um, it also combats social isolation. So it, it works on a number of different levels. Um, one of the, the particularly good um, organisations to, to look at, and they have a number of videos available online, is the Sporting Memories Network. And they're specifically sport based and reminiscence based. Um, and they run clubs and groups across um, the country. They have online output as well. Uh, and it's really worth um, having a look at them. But equally, what you see on the screen here is a session that um, I created at Clifton Library, which is one of our branch libraries back in December 2019. Um, use what you have. It doesn't have to be very, very fancy. I mean, this is a collapsible screen that we purchased as part of a previous project. Um, a laptop and a projector, which we did have to buy. But um, aside from that, it's a number of items from the archive collections. The slightly squashed football you'll see in the middle of that um, shot, just to the left hand side, is the Arsenal football that's referred to in the Reginald Hunt film. Um, but we've got a number of other artifacts there you'll see which come from the Reginald Hunt autograph collection and a number of photographs and programs that have come from a, a variety of other collections. They're all originals. 
The reason we've got the screen is because we purchased a set of memory bank DVDs produced by the Yorkshire Film Archive. They are commercially available, um, but they're designed for reuse for dementia reminiscence and reminiscence work. Whilst they are from the, the Yorkshire Film Archive collections, they are designed to be generic. They can be used anywhere in the country, not just York and Yorkshire. And there is one on sporting life. So they've got six short video clips. And there's some questions you can ask at various points in the video clips. It comes with a user guide. Um, and so I merged that um, online uh, video content with some of the original archives on the table. If you're worried about security or safety, you could easily digitize, particularly the photograph um, collections, and then get them just printed as, as prints um, through any of the commercial companies, and then hand those digital surrogates out or the, the printed surrogates out um, to a group as well, if you're worried about um, having to pass things around or people touching things. Um, but the session really worked quite well, had a good chat, very informal, um, good way of, of um, getting people's thoughts on, on your collections and on what they remember. So supplementing your actual archive collections with um, people's recollections of those sports or where they played or what they did at school. Usually it's quite a lot of fun. I think one of the biggest problems that um, people face when they've not done any of this work before is how to actually get a project off the ground. So this is something that I did want to cover in this session as well. Best place to start is with research. So have a look at what heritage projects have been done in your area. Is there scope for you to collaborate with someone else on a project or join an existing project is also an important question to ask. You might not have all the resources in house. Um, you might not have the capacity to go for an external funding bid. Is there somebody else out there doing something similar or something that you'd like to get involved in? And would they be interested in having another partner on that project? The most important thing, arguably, is what do you actually want to deliver? It's really easy to get carried away with projects um, just because they're exciting and they're new and there's, there's so much scope. So define your scope at the beginning and make sure you stick to it. Decide what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. And that will help you if, you've, if you have to, for example, create an external funding bid, it will help you keep that focus so you don't get distracted. Have a think about who you're trying to reach. Who are your audiences? Who are your current audiences? Um, is it uh, young people? Is it retired people? Is it people coming to reminiscence sessions? Is it players? Identifying your audiences will help you design and publicize your project through appropriate channels and making sure you're doing it in the right way. Um, it also means that when you're defining the activities that you're going to do, you've got suitable activities for all those audiences. Or you might want to do something completely different and target an entirely new audience, in which case, how do you do that and what activities do you need to do to do that? Um, you need to think about the benefits. So what will be the outcomes of the project? Um, particularly, um, a lot of organisations, funding organisations, think about what's your legacy. So what are you going to do now and how are you going to use that, the learnings and use the materials you've created in the future? Um, knowing your outcomes will also ensure that the activities you do have the maximum impact and that's what you're looking for. You want to have an impact on the communities that you serve. And in the case of funded bids, these are necessary so that you can evaluate your activities. So that's why it's worth having a bit of this scoping exercise, answering these questions to start off with. Even if you don't need to go for funding, it just helps you keep on track having that set out at the start. You also need to think about resources and resources come into a number of different categories. So you need to think about uh, people, their time, if that costs, if it's volunteers, how many people you need, um, what all do you need to deliver your project? Um, aside from personnel, it might be equipment. You might not have the equipment you need. Um, so do you need to collaborate with someone else? You know, does somebody else have the equipment you need and you can borrow it? Do you need to fundraise or do you need to apply for external funding? And that all depends on what you've decided you need to do and what audiences you're targeting in the first place. Archive services such as ourselves, we can't write the bid for you. It's got to come from you. It's got to be in your voice. Um, it's got to be um, from the point of view of your, your club or organisation and your audiences, your communities. But we can make suggestions as to funding pots or who to talk to for advice. Um, so do contact your local archive service and say, we're thinking of doing this. 
you know, do we need external funding? Can you help us in any way? And talk to those services. And they, they should be able to respond to you and point you in the right direction of that help and advice. There are a number of further resources available. Um, so our archival guidance for community groups is available on our website. And within that, our guidance booklet for community groups is downloadable as a PDF. It includes a, includes a number of pages on um, how to get the best out of your um, collections, um, how to market them, how to use social media. There's a number of different points covered there and some case studies as well. So it's worth having a look at just to get ideas and inspiration. So this is everything I had to say in this final presentation. Um, obviously, it says question and answer. We had a live question and answer when I presented this live. If you're listening on YouTube, then please do get in contact with us. If you've got any questions, you can email archives at exploreyork.org.uk. Um, I hope this session and the previous two sessions have been interesting and helpful. 